And a very good day to you. Dennis Nowicki here, perhaps entertaining, perhaps informing, perhaps even inspiring. I wish you well. For decades, Dr. Robert T. Bacher has been and continues to be a critically important paleontologist and teacher in his field. His 1986 book, The Dinosaur Heresies, first brought to light that instead of slow, lumbering monsters, dinosaurs were active, warm-blooded creatures, which is now accepted among all his peers. He has breathed life into these prehistoric giants through his animated teachings to the young and old alike. I was fortunate to have interviewed him by phone one day in the mid-2000s for Studium Magazine. Let's begin. After all these years, don't you get bored with field work? I don't get bored at all for the same reason that that Life magazine grabbed me. That's September 7th, 1953. I saw it in the spring of, of 54. I opened that magazine. I was 10 years old in the fourth grade. Opened this magazine. My grandpa's house in the in the living room with the big um, sunny windows in New Jersey. And it wasn't just an article about dinosaurs. It wasn't. And it wasn't just pictures of prehistoric animals, although there were really good ones. It was a beautifully written story and narrative of life from the very beginning, with pictures of fossil jellyfish, mm -hmm. through trilobites and armored squid and the earliest fishes and the earliest land plants and the finback from Texas to Metrodon that we're digging up now. And the early dinosaurs were a little, and the later dinosaurs, a little fur balls, and dinosaurs go extinct, and then there were bigger mammals, and bigger and bigger and bigger, and mammoths, and mastodons, saber-toothed cats. It was an incredible story, and it seemed to be absolutely boundless. Hmm. So many kinds of animals and plants and bugs through so many slices of geological time that there was no way you could ever get to the end. It was like a zoo that never, never ceased. It was incredible. And field work is like that. Every time I go out, there's stuff that we didn't expect. And there are mysteries. Because to understand life through time, you got to understand hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of burials. Each animal has an individual story. Each T-Rex or thin back dimetrodon, that individual animal has a story. Mm -hmm. And it died, and it's death and burial. That's a story. That's a crime scene. And to understand all Demetrodons 300 million years ago, you've got to look at dozens and dozens and dozens of them, their babies, the half-grown ones, and the animals they lived with, type of soil they walked on, how they traveled all over the world. So it, it's you can't get bored. People who work at zoos don't get bored either for the same reason. Life is inexhaustible. The discovery of old and new types of dinosaur fossils and information about them has exploded over the last two decades. Now, how has this happened? Well, when I was growing up back in the mid and late 50s, there were only a few dinosaur books. There were some real good ones. Roy Chapman, Andrew's book, all about dinosaurs. That's wonderful. I still recommend it. But there weren't a lot of books. And they didn't have a lot of color pictures. And there weren't a lot of museums with dinosaur skeletons. I grew up new, near New York City, so I could go to that museum. And there was virtually no TV with dinosaurs. I would write to producers, if you can believe this, a fourth grader, writing to TV producers asking for more dinosaur films. And they would rerun the uh, 1932, 1933 King Kong. Well, I've got some pretty good dinosaur animation, but after you've seen it 117 times, you want to see more. <laughs> the interest in dinosaurs is is kept alive and fed by really good journalism, print journalism like the Life magazine. That was Lincoln Barnett who wrote that 1953 beautiful narrative. Mm. And the more and more electronic media, Jurassic Park was was great. Actually, King Kong was super. And before that, 1925, Lost World, the silent movie Lost World with uh, beautiful stop frame animation. And before that, the Crystal Palace uh, exposition with outdoor life-size dinosaur sculpture. That was 1853. These events, these novels, these stories, these outdoor displays for everybody, the movies, the, the, uh, the video games, I actually helped um, 
make a video game for Sega. Actually, I'm in the Sega game, Jurassic Park. These are great things, and they help fire the imagination of the next wave of scientists. In spite of the fact that your views about dinosaurs are built upon a good deal of common sense, clear explanation, and logic, why then do you think you've been perceived as a rebel or controversial in your beliefs? Well, you know, I started working on what people call the dinosaur renaissance, 1966. I was just a humble undergrad. I did write a, an article called The Superiority of Dinosaurs. Now, at that time, in the late 60s, the textbook picture of dinosaurs were as dead ends. They were slow and stupid and cold-blooded and indifferent parents, and they finally went extinct when the greenhouse environment, the Mesozoic, dried up and cooled off, and brighter, smarter, faster critters, mammals, took over. That was the story. It was in all the textbooks, all of them. Mm -hmm. It just struck me that it was totally illogical from a crime scene approach, because today in hot, humid environments like the Jurassic, you don't see a lot of big reptiles. You just don't. The Serengeti is not ruled by four-ton tortoises. And what's hunting zebra are not gigantic lizards or land crocodiles. They're warm-blooded leopards and cheetahs and lions. Everywhere in the world today where it's hot and humid or hot and dry, environments like the dinosaurs lived in, Reptiles are understory critters. They're the supporting cast, not the rulers. So this idea that dinosaurs won by default, dinosaurs were successful only because it was hot, didn't make sense. I kept on punching at that myth, punching at that uh, portrayal of dinosaurs right through my graduate work. I mean, I put feathers on dinosaurs as early as 1974. Interesting. And that was horrifying for traditional views, just the idea that dinosaurs weren't reptiles, that dinosaurs were warm-blooded, that dinosaurs may have had feathers. These were all shocks to the system. Mm -hmm. Did the fact that dinosaurs laid eggs affect your philosophy about them being related to birds? Eggs are a funny deal, because when I was growing up, there were only a few dinosaurs whose eggs we had, just a couple species. And thanks mostly to work in China and Mongolia, we now have dozens of species of dinosaurs known through their eggs. The eggs come in all different forms, but they do look like bird eggs in, um, in microstructure. You cut a dinosaur egg with a rock saw and look at it with a high-powered microscope, and by gum, that's, that egg had a high metabolic rate. The oxygen, the gas exchange to the egg was was at a very high rate. They don't look like turtle eggs, and they don't look like croc eggs, and they don't look like lizard eggs. So yeah, the the explosion of egg data from dinosaurs has reinforced the idea that these guys are basically giant birds. Over the years, what has been your biggest challenge as a paleontologist? Gee, the biggest challenge is, will sound mundane, it's generating financial support for museum exhibits and museum staff and museum docents, the guys who do the tours. You can get money to dig. And you can get volunteers to help you dig. You can even get volunteers to help you clean the bones. That's pretty easy. But most folks, museum patrons, people who come on weekends to look at the exhibit, don't realize that their visit is subsidized. Whatever they pay for an entrance fee is about half the cost of a museum and that we need the generosity of, of patrons to keep the thing going. The exhibits without really good tour guides, without really good exhibit staff to make new exhibits, you know, exhibits will age and become dull and even wrong after a while. And that's hard, you know? Museums have to work hard to keep going. Do you have any personal feelings about people buying and collecting dinosaur fossils? The, um, the first museums with good displays got their fossils mostly by buying them. One of my heroes is the first Jurassic bone hunter, the person who was f the first to dig complete skeletons and sell them to the British Museum and other museums so the museum could display that. 
And that's how museums got started. And that person started in 1811, and she was 12 years old at the time. It was Ms. Mary Anning, with two N's. Mm -hmm. And uh, she never married, unusual in the early part of the 19th century. And she became a heroine to museums all over the world. That's the original way museums got their public displays, by buying them from such talented and dedicated workers like like Mary Anning, and later on in this country, the Sternberg family. Mm -hmm. So this has been a tradition and a good one. Do you think dinosaur fossils should be held in museums rather than in private collections? You can't put all fossils, you can't even put most fossil bones in museums. There's not enough space. What you want to preserve at all costs is the data. Like if you go to the White River Badlands of Wyoming, this is a lady is seen, the time of the first saber-toothed cats and the earliest dog-like things and tightness here so it look like giant rhinos. You could see, in a good day, two dozen skulls hmm. of oreodons. These things that look like short-legged deer. Thousands and thousands of these guys have been dug. It's wonderful data. You can study the babies and the moms and the dads and the evolutionary rates, and you can find... These guys, these oreodons, curled up in burrows with their pups right next to them. No museum, no group of museums could possibly take all of the oreodon skulls that erode out, that rot to pieces every year from Wyoming. Couldn't do it. Now, here's where the private collector and the um, professional collector come in. They can harvest all these skulls before they rot. They can record the data keep the data, and sell them so people can have a bit of prehistoric history. Hmm. Otherwise, it's gone. It's just totally gone. I think most folks, including some of my colleagues, don't know that nature is the biggest vandal. Nature destroys more bones every year, 10 times more bones, 100 times more bones than uh, vandals. Do you think museums should be willing to trade with private collectors to improve their displays? Oh, absolutely. The Houston Museum has been very good that way. They've worked with many fine professional collectors, including the Black Hills Institute, run by the Larson Brothers, best in the world. Mm -hmm. Their techniques are cutting edge, and they're willing to teach museums the new methods of collecting delicate fossils, preserving them, mounting them. And absolutely, there are people like the Black Hills, and there are others are absolutely necessary for the for the uh, non-profit museum. You disagree with the asteroid or comet theory of dinosaur extinction and feel that disease spread through the intermingling of dinosaur types was the culprit. Now, could you expound a little on this theory? This isn't a, an idea original to me at all, although I've heard it many times working at zoos, at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. I worked at the Bronx Zoo briefly. Anywhere where people worry about foreign animals, uh, game managers in South Africa I talk to have the same worry. The biggest threat to big animals today, big animals on land, is the sudden invasion of foreign big animals. The foreign big animals can be nasty predators and competitors and carry dozens of diseases each. And this notion that invasions of foreign species would cause major extinction goes back to the 1890s with Professor Depere in France Professor Osborne in New York City. Both of them knew zoos. Osborne was on the board of the Bronx Zoo, and, and he dug fossils. He pointed out that every time there was an extinction of large animals during the age of mammals, mastodons or mammoths or saber-toothed cats or giant bears, all those guys, whenever that happened, it coincided with mixing of big animals from Europe to Asia, Asia to North America, North, North America to South America. In 1895, these guys saw this pattern. And it's been confirmed again and again and again. And, you know, call up your local zoo or call up the World Wildlife Fund or call up the game rangers in your state and they will say, yes, that is the most frightening threat. If someone releases four or five or six species of Indian or Mongolian or African animals into Texas or Wyoming or Kentucky, all hell will break loose. Is it feasible that the same thing could happen to humans? 
there's some wonderful books on the history of foreign diseases. Get Plagues and Peoples. It's about 20 years old. It's good. Or Rats, Lice, and History. Or the more recent studies of flesh-eating bacteria, hemorrhagic African fever and AIDS. We're doing a terrible job of screening our um, our introduction of foreign diseases. Uh, they should be much, much more careful screening of passengers getting on and off international airlines and the scare in Canada with the uh, really bad influenza from Asia is just a small example of what of what can happen. We're just not careful enough at all or with our food products. Uh, we're much tighter than we were 20 years ago, but we still let stuff through. It's it's really scary. The, the tropics are full of thousands of potentially devastating disease vectors, and we're just not careful enough. Could there have been protected pockets of surviving dinosaurs that were beyond the reach of land bridges and intermingling? Yeah, it should have been. If, if Depere and Osborne are right, if the mixing of fauna is what causes major extinctions, extinctions are not going to happen at the same time all over the world. There will be pockets. There will be certain islands or mountain chains or isolated lakes. We don't have enough data right now to determine whether some dinosaurs survived longer here than there. Not yet. Mm -hmm. We know from mammoths that that was true. There were Arctic islands that supported mammoths long after they were extinct in mainland Asia. That did happen. So yeah, you're right. That should have happened. You were a Pentecostal minister with strong beliefs seated in creationism. Now, have you found as a paleontologist any personal struggles between the science and religion? You know, I never have. That's funny. I grew up in northern New Jersey, and my church there was independent evangelical, big supporter of Billy Graham when he started his crusades. And at that time, my mom was taking me to the museum in New York City regularly to look at fossils, and they bought me books about fossils. Even though the church's position was rather anti-Darwin, I never saw a conflict at all, at all. And looking back on it, I'm surprised. Why didn't I? I think the answer is St. Augustine. This Life magazine article by Lincoln Barnett, which I recommend, by the way, if you haven't read it, mm -hmm. it's really well done and it's fun. It's long, but it's beautiful. On the first page is a reference to St. Augustine. On the very first page. Hmm. And uh, the spirit of that article in Life was not anti-religion or anti Bible or anti-scripture. It was really quite um, lyrical. And recently I've gotten into St. Augustine reading some of them, some of them, the original Latin. Interesting guy. He wrote the best book on creation, on Genesis, ever done by a Christian scholar. And he sees it as a mystical uh, instruction that the days, the six days of creation, on the seventh day, God rested. Six days weren't consecutive days, 24-hour days, but are units of revelation. And although St. Augustine didn't read or speak Hebrew, he caught the gist of what the Hebrew says. Because St. Augustine was dealing with a pretty bad translation in Latin of Genesis. Nonetheless, he caught the essence of, uh, of the Hebrew. And uh, most modern Biblical scholars, both Jewish and Catholic and Protestant, have come around to say, you know, this Augustine guy, year 400, dealing with a bad translation, he got it right. <laughs> these, these seven days, six days of creation, one day of rest, were not meant to, the original language was not meant to express a simple week, a simple mundane week. It's something greater, something more beautiful. And I think I caught that a little bit. As a 10-year-old kid, I just sort of sense that Augustinian uh, undercurrent in Life magazine. Go figure. Yeah, but do get it. I highly recommend anyone who loves fossils and anyone who's interested in the creation-evolution debate, get a hold of Lincoln Barnett's September 7, 1953 article. He's passed to his reward. I hope he's been compensated in the, in the afterlife for his wonderful piece of work. Are there any specific goals that you have for the future? Oh, 
gosh, yes. One immediate goal is to put up a big, beautiful, pink-stained Demetrodon skeleton here in Houston. This is the biggest museum in Texas by far. We get 2.5 to 3 million visitors a year. Hmm makes it maybe the second largest natural history museum in the country. We don't have a Demetrodon, the most famous Texas fossil. This great finback, the first land predator that ever evolved, and the first animal to show clear signs in a reptilian body of beginning to evolve towards a mammal. This wonderful beast. We don't have one. And I want 3.2 million visitors a year to see our Houston Museum, Demetrodon, and we got the face last week. Dr. Bakker, what's your opinion about fake fossils that have appeared from different international sources? Faked fossils, frauds, are out there in great abundance because collectors, mostly European and North American and, and some Asian too, are willing to pay money, good money, for a good-looking fossil. Well, the people out there in China and Mongolia and North Africa and Morocco um, who live near the fossil beds, these are not wealthy people, nor are they um, dopes. And if they hear that a slab of gray rock with a little dinosaur in it, with little feathers coming off the elbows and the ankles, this will command retail 500000 a million bucks. They learn how to fake them. Mm -hmm. And I, I studied the x-rays of Archaeoraptor, this faked um, feathered dinosaur from Liaoning, China. It was, it was cleverly faked. Actually, it wasn't faked. It's a composite. It had the front end of a dinosaur and the feathers of a Cretaceous bird and the tail of another Cretaceous bird. And the pieces have been fit, fitted together pretty well. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is a grotum. And you mentioned the Cetacosaurus, these, these very strong digging dinosaurs, sometimes found complete, curled up in their own burrow, sometimes found flattened in lake sediment. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds have been exported. I've seen probably illegally or semi-legally, and most of them are ending up in private collections, and the data are lost. That's That's the big problem. It's not that the individual fossils are lost because they're inexhaustible. But we should know where each and every one was dug. And we should know something about the bad-looking ones, ones you couldn't be sold, but tell you a little bit about the individual. There should be a data bank. Now, there is an organization of applied paleontologists, a very good one, APS, A-A-P-S, that is urging commercial collectors, wherever they are, collect the data, preserve the data, log in each and every specimen, give the um, the owner of the specimen, whoever buys it, museum, private individual, the data log, so there would be a worldwide registry free on the internet so that scientists and scholars all over could access the census of specimens. This effort has just barely begun, but I heartily recommend it. Finally, for those of us just beginning to gain an interest in dinosaurs and their fossils, do you have any recommended reading? I would, yeah, do look at some of the old books, because even though some of the some of the interpretations are out of date, books before 1970 tend to see dinosaurs as cold-blooded reptiles without without feathers. Nonetheless, some of the older books capture the electricity of actually digging. Fossils. Get a hold of Roy Chapman Andrews' book, All About Dinosaurs. And he did a second one called All About Prehistoric Mammals. Mm -hmm. He tells the story of finding a, finding a bone bed in Mongolia of shovel-jawed mastodons, these mastodons whose lower jaw went on and on and on and on and was shaped like a coal shovel. And he, the bed he found had adults and juveniles and babies and even fetuses. It's an incredible story. Well, any last thoughts? Now, you and I and all of us involved in museums know that evolution is, is true. It's a historical fact. But, yeah. but, how does knowing about evolution make you a more ethical citizen? How does make this make you a better person, knowing about evolution? And that's a hard question. 
the loud creationists, including my mother, say that we paleontologists are spreading nihilism all around and will make little kids feel that there's no future and there's no purpose in life and there's no design in creation and therefore why bother eating green vegetables or listening to our parents. So how does knowing about fossils and evolution make you a better person functioning day after day? The old idea that evolution improves species is not part of the canon anymore. Evolution now is seen as a sort of a mindless, gene-centered or individual-centered process that doesn't necessarily make you better. It just makes you survive better than your neighbors over there in the other pasture, the other hill. Does it make you better? No, not in a predictable way. That's what that's what depresses some people. <laughs> yeah, we're smarter. I mean, we're smarter than chimps. I helped raise a family of chimps when I was uh, at Harvard, and chimps are real smart and very complex emotionally and really neat. But you know, we're smarter than chimps. But are we more ethical than chimps? I don't know. Chimps, boy, especially young male chimps, they can form gangs and beat up on other chimps. They even can rape all of the ills we see in gangs today in humans. You can see the same ills in gangs of chimps. Are we better than chimps? I don't know. Like we teach, this is sort of the South, Houston, sort of, sort of, sort of. The Baptist creationist um, um, influence isn't as strong as North Texas, where I dig too, and the people are really nice to us when we're digging up fossils up there. Um, but I, I grew up surrounded by strong creationists who were very anti-Darwin, anti-evolution, because they were sure that teaching Darwin to little kids would make them lose respect for any Judeo-Christian ethic at all. Mm -hmm. like the Columbine killers in, in, in Colorado, the, one of them was wearing a T-shirt about, about natural selection. I don't know. Tough. I mean, because it's true. Evolution is true, so we, we should teach it. Does it make us better? Now, it doesn't bother little kids. Kids who, who start loving dinosaurs and fossils, they start in kindergarten or first grade, and it burns strongly in their brains through fourth or fifth or sixth grade, and you don't get nihilism getting into brains until middle school. Eighth grade, ninth grade, people read Nietzsche and, and start wearing black eye makeup and black <laughs> um, uh, fingernails and, mm -hmm. you know, dressing all in black. And But by that by then, they've lost their love of dinosaurs, usually. When I was a kid, it was just boys, but now boys and girls starting first grade love dinosaurs because they're big and spectacular or little and come in many different shapes and come from far away in time, and it's exotic and wonderful. Kids love them. But how can we get an ethical message through dinosaurs to kids? How can we make kids better citizens through fossils? How can we do that? When I was growing up in the 50s, people talked about the balance of nature and ecological communities being designed for stability and for maximum happiness of all the species. Well, you know, no, that's, that's not true, that, that animal species compete with each other, and within species, clans compete with each other, and within clans, families compete, within families, individuals can bleed, uh, mm -hmm. compete. I remember when I learned that Eagles lay two eggs, usually. Mm -hmm. and the first egg to hatch, the instinct is to find the other egg and roll it out of the nest. You know, you get rid of sibling rivalry by <laughs> by rolling your sibling out of the nest. <laughs> and that happens a lot. You, nature can be frightfully cruel, and it's genetic. And what are we telling kids when they hear about how cruel nature can be? What can they what can they bring away? And the best thing I can think of, and I think it's true, is that nature tells us to examine ourselves and look for these nasty genes, nasty tendencies, built in by natural selection. That's what we have to overcome. St. Augustine would have called it original sin, these mm -hmm. These urges we have, and they're natural, they're natural, mm -hmm. and they're probably built in by evolution, and that's the stuff that we've got to control to be better people. Uh, Kate Hepburn said that in that wonderful movie, African Queen, she said, 
Nature is what we are placed upon the earth to rise above.